Anyone who has spent time outdoors has experienced that moment of transcendence, where the scope and beauty of a place inspire hidden emotions to rise to the surface. Ross's moment happened the instant the fog lifted, and he saw Granite Peak for the first time. Months of preparation had preceded this moment, and before him loomed a mountain so much more awe-inspiring than he could have imagined. My moment happened in the pre-dawn hours of the fourth morning. My eyes were drawn to the water, hemmed in by blue-gray mountains etched with snowfields. The sky's reflection began to blur as the wind picked up, and the scene filled me with a sense of wonder and gratitude. Moments like these can't be planned. They happen organically. And when the sensations arrive, they reveal some deep, unfamiliar place that lives within us. We would all be moved to tears at some point during our week-long hike. It is one of the unspoken reasons why we take these trips. And we are hiking in the bare tooth of Sorka Wilderness, just north of Yellowstone in Montana. We're fired up. We started from the Beartooth Highway in Wyoming. Five good friends connected by a love of wilderness. Wary from travel and doing our best to acclimatize to the altitude, we hiked only a few miles the first day and camped on a peninsula jutting into Beauty Lake. The next day, we crossed into Montana. And with the exception of one high pass, we spent most of the day hiking through forest, taking much needed swim breaks. We had some tough miles ahead. I had planned a seven night trip and expected us to hike over 70 miles with 16,000 feet of elevation gain. The scenery was like something from a dream. We skirted through forests and meadows of wildflowers. And forded streams and boulder gardens. and cooled off in the multitude of lakes, <laughs> surrounded by serrated peaks. That might be the way to do it. We didn't always hike as a unit, some of us splintering off to take a swim, but we always reconnected along the trail, usually at lunch. What looks like chaos is really a well-orchestrated feeding frenzy. Tonight, we would sleep on the shores of Elaine Lake, which like most lakes here, had some exceptional fishing. Oh. By the third day, we were in a groove. Shouldering our packs seemed less painful, and our legs knew what to do. Hike from one campsite to the next, stopping for lunch somewhere in between.
Well, Ross and I took a little off-trail excursion, um, went a different route from the rest of the guys, and just reconnected to the trail after a little bushwhacking and route finding. And I can tell you, there is no better sight than finding a trail after you haven't seen one for a while. We spotted Greg fishing alone. He didn't notice us at first, as he was entranced by the river. He could have spent the entire day in that spot, fully engaged in the moment, where the actual catching of a fish was secondary to the art of casting itself. After an especially hard day of big elevation gain, ready to drop our packs and relax, we set camp by a glacial tarn. Must have items on this trip. Food, water, mosquito net. family of mountain goats greeted us warily and passed through camp several times that night. In the morning, we crossed the divide and dropped into the East Rosebud Creek drainage. Known as one of the prettiest watersheds in Montana and also the state's most newly designated wild and scenic river. East Rosebud Creek flows freely for 20 miles, dropping some 4,000 feet from its headwaters to its namesake valley, where we were headed. All that elevation loss makes for lots of waterfalls, including an unexpected 200-foot high one. Luke's transcendent moment would arrive near one of those waterfalls. When I caught up to him, he was standing in silence, enraptured by a double cascade that had just revealed itself through a gap in the trees. He stared at it for a long time, trying to make sense of it, and would later tell me how important that moment was to him. That life is full of memories that change in intensity over time, and that he wanted to remember that moment exactly as it was. Our group would split up over the next few hours as we enjoyed the scenery at our own pace. We met for a break at Dewey Lake where a snow-encrusted cirque reflected in the dark waters. We were now hiking on a portion of the trail called the Beaten Path. Yet despite that name, we saw virtually no one else on it. The reason being that a major flood the previous summer had washed out the road to the closest trailhead. In a once-in-a-lifetime scenario, we would have Montana's most beautiful river gorge to ourselves. As we reached Rim Rock Lake, I was reminded of those floods, which wiped out the bridge here and caused even more devastation downstream. A storm system had dumped lots of rain, which melted much of the snow. It all flowed downstream, that's the bridge. Gaining momentum as the tributaries in this drainage added volume. It incised riverbanks, uprooted forests, created landslides, and destroyed long stretches of trail. 
downstream damage in the town of Red Lodge would be even more profound. We camped along the site that used to be Elk Lake. The floods had blown out its terminal moraine, draining its contents, and transforming this section back into a stream. Taylor's transcendent moment would happen each night. As he lay in his tent, he would look at a picture of his family and send his love to them. The picture showed them on vacation. And a week later, that very spot was engulfed by a deadly wildfire. He would share these feelings with me later, highlighting the fragility and impermanence of life. On the fifth day, we continued downstream, route finding through a trailless section of riverbed. We reached Alpine, where the East Rosebud Trailhead begins. It was eerily silent. Last summer's floods had destroyed the road that leads here. The previous day's long descent would be mirrored by a major ascent today. We ascended into the Phantom Creek drainage on a long steep grade, resting a few miles later for lunch, where the trail briefly leveled out. We climbed for several more hours, eventually finding a high campground below the pass the only flat ground in the area, and one with a water source that percolated from rocks below a melting snowfield. What you got there? Oh, it's a salad, man. Greens, <laughs> forged greens. And delicious with a little soba, salmon. Mm. Excited about this. It's the best meal of the week. All right, we had the biggest climb of the whole trip today, over 4,000 vertical feet, brutal day. And tomorrow we head up that, up to that plateau. That's called froze to death plateau. Uh, ominous sounding and it should be. It's a very large boulder strewn plateau of sorts um, that will lead us to our next campsite uh, near Tempest Mountain and uh, will be the final approach before our summit day of Granite Peak. The divine wind. The weather was perfect for the first half of our trip, but its mood was changing. After hearing that bad weather was moving in, we discussed our options. Three of our crew decided to bail and would hike out in the direction of Red Lodge. I understood their concern about the weather and the associated dangers of bad weather at high altitudes, especially on an exposed and tricky peak like the one we were planning to climb. But I had invested so much in this opportunity and was unwilling to turn my back on Granite Peak. Ross and I pressed on, and in the morning we topped out at the pass then veered off trail to start the long slog across froze to death plateau. So most people that climb granite do it as a overnight trip. And they would be camping on the same spot of this plateau as we are, but they would have come up from a much closer trailhead from the north. We decided to make it a week long journey and started near the uh, Beartooth Highway in Wyoming and have been hiking for, I think this is our fifth day. So just giving it a little extra, more, you know, 
making it more than just a peak bagging exercise, making it a true wilderness experience. And uh, I'm grateful for that. It's gonna make this trip a more well-rounded, memorable trip. Because at the end of the day, it's not necessarily nabbing a peak, it's the experiences with your friends and communing with nature um, throughout the trip that, that really lend value to this whole uh, enterprise of backcountry hiking. If we could stay on course, we should be able to reach high camp in about six more miles, putting us in a position to summit Granite Peak the next day. The rain, which had flirted with us previously, finally decided to unload on us. My pants were soaked. As we were enveloped by a dense fog, visibility dwindled, rendering our maps useless. We built an emergency bivy in a steep boulder field and waited. Well, it stopped raining long enough for us to leave the bivy and start exploring. Um, there's no critical problems here. It's not lightning. If it were, we'd be off this mountain. So we're good. We've, we've been warming up, hiking around. The, the challenge currently is the visibility. We've got about maybe 70 yards of visibility. And so what we're really hoping for is like the clouds to part for 10 seconds to give us a peek so we can verify our location. Moments later, we got our wish. So in a pretty big turn of events, the rain stopped and the cloud ceiling has slowly been lifting. Found a, found a decent little campsite, uh, but we're realizing now we gotta backtrack a little, get up and over a ridge. The downside is I think we're expecting the same weather tomorrow. And, and this is a peak that can't be taken lightly. Granite Peak has a, a narrow window um, in terms of how you can get up it um, without it being technical. We enjoyed a final sunset from our tents and went to sleep early so that we could get an alpine start the next morning. Well, now that's that's one of the reasons we come out here. As we crested the pass, Granite revealed herself. She was immense, and no amount of research could have prepared me for the sight. But the window was beginning to shut. Look at that bowl. Uh. Well, the decision's been made. It's been a joint one. We feel good about it. Um, it doesn't come without emotional consequences. Turning our back on this mountain, um, as Ross had said, it feels like kind of giving up on a dream. It's some, we, we had this vision in our head of working for a week towards this peak, doing a long backcountry push getting to this point to where we could ascend what is a magnificent mountain and a challenging and technical one as well. High-fiving on the summit and then coming down the backside and fishing and enjoying ourselves and relaxing and celebrating. And we're not gonna have that part, but we've had everything else and it's uh, it's strangely very emotional to not climb this peak. It's it's almost like we can reach out and touch it. It's, as the bird flies just um, just a few miles away from us. But the route to get to it is um, an arduous one. If it were a clear day, we would be gunning for this thing, but that's not how the cards were dealt. So we'll have our moment and uh, be grateful we got to see this beautiful peak and really hope one day we can we can come back and give it our best. We accepted our final remaining option, turn around and hike out. 
I was able to send out a text so the guys would know that the plans had changed. Thus started the long trip out. Thinking about the mountain days later would still evoke a powerful emotional response. It may sound weird that a hulking mass of rock can bring a person to tears, but those of us who are obsessed with mountains understand the power they possess and the unparalleled feeling of standing atop a hard-fought summit. It would be a challenging two full days of hiking with lots of elevation gained and lost. We had made a decision. There was no turning back. Running low on food, we gorged ourselves on the abundant blueberries, raspberries, and thimbleberries. We were able to dry our gear out on a pass, only to find ourselves drenched again an hour later. Ross is talking about the range of emotions we've experienced, not only on this trip, but really today. Today's been a microcosm. The trail's been longer, it's been steeper. We're on an exposed plateau currently and are getting hailed on. We're soaking wet, we're freezing, and we couldn't ask for anything more. These are some of those moments, the kind you wouldn't ever script, but when they happen, they only augment the overall experience and the sense of adventure. And I'm so grateful for this. <laughs> Our shuttle has arrived. Our normal lives are full of equally monumental moments, often overlooked unless we slow down and change our perspective. Those small moments where I find myself brimming with happiness. Wonder and gratitude. Moments of transcendence that are elicited by a trip of a lifetime. And that which can also be experienced much, much closer to home. So close, yet so far. I'm peeing. <laughs> oh, you're peeing?